Very warm greetings to everyone in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and I thank God for this privilege and this opportunity where I can share with you from God's Word and to rejoice with Gethsemane BP Church on her 25th anniversary. I'd like to thank the pastor and the Board of Elders and Session for this kind invitation to share with you from God's Word. The title is The Church, a Household Founded on Christ. The text is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and verse 20. Please allow me to read to you from God's Word. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. We live in the 21st century, a time where Christianity has spread all over the world. It began like a tiny little mustard seed through 12 apostles. The church grew to be what she is today after nearly 2,000 years. It is found in every continent on this earth. It has grown far and wide. And today, as you can see, Christianity has many faces. These faces, we call them denominations. And these denominations used to stand true and firm on the Lord Jesus Christ. But today, these denominations are trying to change their faces, and they are going back to Rome. So you have the Roman Catholic Church with more than a billion members, and now the whole world is focusing on Rome because the Pope had just stepped down, something that had never been done since, what, four or five hundred years ago, a long, long time. Normally, Popes will just serve their term until they die. They do not quit, but this Pope resigned because he says he's too old. One point over billion people. Is that what Christianity is? Do they represent Christianity? Is this what the household founded on Christ look like? It is grand, it is big. For many of us who have traveled to Rome, you can see the spectacular architecture Glorious, mighty, millions and millions of dollars worth of money spent in building these structures, taking care of these structures, and the grandeur and the pomp that they go through when they celebrate all the many religious festivals, telling the world that the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the representative, living representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what the church is all about? And then you have uh, the Protestant with her many other denominations, the largest of which would probably be the Anglican Church. Now they are going back to Rome. The previous archbishops that had looked after this, what, 60 over million members all over the world, said that it is not possible for God, if he ever exists, to allow the tsunami to kill so many hundreds of thousands of people, that tsunami that took place on Boxing Day some years back. Then others will deny the resurrection of Christ. And they are the leaders of the largest church within the Protestant movement. And then we have the face of the Charismatics, the fastest growing church, the world had ever seen. Born around 1906, in slightly over 100 years, they have dominated the Protestant Christian scene. Whether you like to admit it or not, their growth and their size and their numbers will have the loudest voice. So these are the many faces of Christianity. Is this what the household founded on Christ is all about? The BP churches, as you can see, even when our founding father, Reverend Timothy Toh, was alive, 
It has splintered into many different shades, many different sizes, many different ways of worship, many different voices, different doctrines, different behavior, different BP churches. Same name, but so different. This household founded on Christ has to be the true church. The local churches are very, very important to God. It is very important because since the day of Pentecost, God had replaced Israel, which had been God's national witness since the time of Moses. But when Israel rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, God replaced the national witness, Israel, with the local church, the household that is supposed to be founded on Christ. And that was the early beginning of the local church, a church that was visible, a church that began in Jerusalem and then spread within Judea, and then it went into Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. This blueprint of the growth and birth of the church came from God himself in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And that's why the local churches are so important. They are to represent the Lord Jesus Christ just as Israel did in the Old Testament times. Look at Israel today. You can't find God's grace and God's mercy and Israel can't point us to Christ. And that's why in Romans the Bible explains because of Israel's rejection and disqualification, God has raised up the church. And this church has come under the attack and the onslaught of the evil one from day one. You study the book of Acts, and you realize that the book of Acts is one of the books, if not the only book, if you study it very carefully, that has no conclusion. There's a conclusion when it comes to the Gospels. There's a conclusion when it comes to all the epistles. There's definitely a conclusion when it comes to the book of Revelation. But the book of Acts has no conclusion. It's as if God is telling us, that through all these local churches that I'm going to found by the power of the Holy Spirit, spread them across the world, and as long as they continue to fight the good fight of faith, they add another page to my church. And so tonight we're going to look at a household that is founded on Christ. How important is the foundation of any building? You and I know how important the foundation is. Because no matter how grand and how glorious the building is, if the foundation is weak, whatever grandeur, whatever kind of material you put into this building to make it beautiful, but if the foundation is weak, the slightest jolt, the slightest shake of the earth, the whole thing will come cr crumbling down. You know that. People in Japan, they know that the best because they suffer earthquakes so regularly. We had a friend who was posted there, he and his wife, he went there to study, actually not posted there, he went there to do his doctorate. And so he stayed there for about three years. He said and shared with us that the first few couple of weeks when they were there, every time there was a tremble, there was a shake, their little apartment would shake and vibrate. And they would be very nervous and panic. After a few months, when the shake comes, they get used to it. They don't bother anymore. Of course, they never expected the tsunami to come. But as far as the Japanese architectures are concerned, you realize that they designed the building with the kind of foundation that is able to take earthquake. That when it's shake, they will move together with the movement of the earth. And the foundation was designed to move and to keep the building upright and intact and strong. They understood that. The engineers understood that. Everybody in Japan who live in high-rise building would understand that. That's why many of these buildings that you see in Japan, they're all made of wood. They use tatami mats because of earthquakes. You do not have bricks because when a brick drops on your head, it is deadly, fatal. But when a piece of wood drops on you and if pieces of bamboo drop on top of you, you may get injured, but probably not fatal. You won't die. They know, they understand. A foundation is crucial. 
and you realize that the depth, the size, the strength of the foundation is designed directly proportional to the size of the building. You do not want to have major foundation when you build a tiny little house. We study all these things in architecture. You want to build a bungalow near the sea, you don't use piling. Big mistake. Because you realize that underneath, the power will just simply slip away. No matter how you keep on piling, 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 because unless the power has bedrock foundation that is solid and sure and firm to hold on, to anchor the power, you keep on piling, there is no end. So you want to build a building, a house, for example, Near the sea, you have a floating foundation. Put it on the sand, make it solid enough because it's only a house, maximum two-story height. You don't need that big a foundation. But if you want to build a 40-story building, you better have foundations that are firm and solid that can carry the weight of this 40-story building. And so what we find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 is a description of this building that the foundation has to carry. What exactly is this building that the foundation has to carry? Now, as you know, the church is not this physical building. I mean, this building is not, does not belong to Gethsemane anyway. The church is always the people, not the physical building, not the land. It has nothing to do with the physical building and the land. If this is your impression of a church, then you are most mistaken and you have to change your thinking. That's our problem. Sometimes we think that the church is the building. The church is not the building. The church will be the people inside the building. When people leave a regular church building, what you have is just an empty room. An empty hall. You may call it the sanctuary. Sanctuary means a holy place. But it's not a holy place per se because you're going to find the, the housekeeper going inside there doing vacuuming. I mean, they don't do vacuuming inside the holy place in the tabernacle, right? No record. You, your, your, your Bible got the priest go there and sweep the floor? No record. You don't just go in there because in the Old Testament time as a nation, they were married to the land. They need the land. But for us, it is the people. And in verse 19, that's exactly what we find. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. So these were not part of the building, the household of Christ, of God, because previously they were strangers and foreigners. To whom? Not to this world. They were very at home in this world. They were very much citizens of this world. They loved this world. We were all like that. Now what kind of character, what kind of description do you think God would describe the citizens of this earth? We were strangers and foreigners to God, to the people of God, to the things of God. But we were very friendly, very much at home, very familiar with the things that are of this earth. What kind of character? Well, the earlier verses of chapter 2 give us a kind of a description. Verse 3, for example, Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what we were. Verse 5, we were dead in sin. You know what's the meaning of dead in sin? Sin was our master. We did not even know that we were dead. We thought that living means living in a luxury apartment. Living means I'm going to be a multi-millionaire. These were our ambitions. These were our goals, our aims. That's why the Bible says we were strangers. Strangers means we have no knowledge of the things of God. We become so uncomfortable in the things of God. That's why we were strangers. When I was an unbeliever, I've never been to church. When people talk about the Bible, it's just to me just like any other storybook written by man. Never seen a hymnal before because hymnals are strange books because most hymnals, you realize, they have no page numbers. The only book, I mean the kind of books that I'm used to, when I go to school, they all have numbers. This one, they have hymn numbers, not page numbers. What kind of book has no page numbers, hymn numbers? Very familiar. I was, these things are very strange to me. When I first went to church, you don't know when to sit, when to stand. Why do you have to stand? Why do you sit so many times? Why do you all sit down? So many things you are not familiar with. Really strangers. You don't pray in the name of Christ. Who is Christ? Completely, totally oblivious of the things of God. But very comfortable with the things of the world. Very much like to 
Grab as much of the things of the world as possible. Study very hard in school. Study very hard in university. Spend many, many hours of sleepless nights because you have to do projects and designs and make models, the drawings, and then go to exams so that I can graduate, get a good job, and like everybody else, amass as much wealth as I could grab with my bare hands and then be a millionaire as young as possible, hopefully. These are all our aims. And the Bible saw all of us and God says, these are called the lusts of our flesh. Is that not so? Lust means strong desires of our flesh. That's what we all were. That's what all of them were. That's what the Apostle Paul was. He was the author of this epistle. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Exactly, precisely. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Whatever my mind thinks. And I work very, very hard. Sometimes didn't even sleep for 48 hours just to finish the project and pass it up and get as high a grade as possible. And if I do not get as high a grade as possible, I make sure that my friends do not get and copy my work. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, in architecture, you do design. And you know, design is all from the head. You have to be as creative as possible. It's not like you study the match, you memorize the formula, you practice enough, and then you just get it done. So we have design projects, and those are the most important. And if you fail, you're going to repeat the whole year. There is no re, re you know. Like if you fail a subject during the vacation, or when people go out on vacation during the months of May and June, you can take a re. They allow you a subject, you fail it. But for design, you can't. You're going to repeat the whole year. Nobody wants to repeat the whole year. It's already a four, four and a half year course during my time. You don't want to repeat. So when design comes, we have to be in class. I did. I don't know whether my classmates did what I did or not. Now, what I did was this. I will bring my fake design to class. Then I should put it on my table. Because my friends all will come and see, you see, talk to me. Then I know their eyes are looking, you see. Ah, they'll take my ideas. Ah, they'll take my design. They will see here, see this, and see that. But my real design is back home, you see. So I just come here, pretend, you know. So that they will not get my real design. Because they get my real design, and they can present it better, draw better, color better, paint better, I'm in trouble. And then when they submit, and they can talk better than me, I'm even bigger trouble. Because then the lecturer will say, hey, how come your design is so close to his? He, they copy mine. No, no, they, he copy mine. Uh, yeah, then, nightmare. Right? That's what we were. The desires of the flesh. Full of it. And I'm sure you can identify with me because all of us were the same. This is a description of all of us. This was a description of the Christians in the first generation, first AD. It was the same description throughout Every age, every generation, doesn't matter whether you live in Europe or in China or in Timbuktu or up on a mountain or in the forest. It's all the same. This is a common description of every human being and that's why the Bible says, ye are no more. If you are part of the building, the household founded on Christ, you are no more strangers and foreigners. Strangers, foreigners, foreigners, they are like sojourners. The difference between strangers and sojourners is this. If I come to a country for the first time, everything is strange to me. The culture is different, the food is different, the taste is different, the dressing is different, the whole way of life is different. I mean, when I first went to Kenya, if they tell you, oh, you go this, you go this, it's very near, don't worry, just go straight and you'll be there. <laughs> Kenya near means eight hours, you know. For Singapore, near means what? Come downstairs, right? Just go to downstairs, the curry puff in Old Chunky. Just downstairs, very near. Very near, right? Just go downstairs and get there, right? That's Singapore mentality. So you go there, very near. Same word, but near. N-E-A-R, near. You go to Kenya, near, you're in trouble. When they say it is far, means four days and above. <laughs> Not too far, midway is two to four days. That's their mindset of Travelling, time, to me, stranger. But if you stay there long enough, you become very familiar with their food, the culture, the thinking and everything, but as long as you're not a citizen, you'll be called a sojourner. A sojourner is called a permanent stranger. Let's put it this way. I mean, that's how the Bible describes it. A permanent stranger. You are there, but you're not a citizen. You're not part of the people. You don't look like them. 
You are not going to be a citizen there. They know that you are an outsider, but you are very familiar with everything in the, what they do in the country, but you are not part of them. That's what God is now telling us. You are no more strangers and foreigners to God. Now you must be sojourners and strangers to the world now. That's the reverse role. Previously, when you and I were not born again, when we fulfill the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, whatever my flesh desires, I eat, I do. That's why you have fornicators. That's why you have all kinds of sin. Whatever my mind wants, I don't care how many lives I stab. I don't care how many people I destroy and betray. I, as long as I get what I want, I just don't care. That was what we were like. But now God says, you are no more strangers and foreigners to God. Because when we behave like that, we were really strangers and foreigners to the things of God. But now, God says, we are fellow citizens. How does a person become a fellow citizen? How does a person become a fellow citizen? Well, the Bible explained to us. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. The sin that we committed killed us. And that's why the Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sin. And then look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sin, God had quickened us together with Christ. God made us alive, gave us life, opened our eyes. open our eyes. I thank God I came to know Christ when I was in my second year in architecture. Slowly but surely, something begins to change. By the time I graduated in my fifth year, the ambition of grabbing and getting the things of the world just simply dissipated and disappeared. I did not know when it disappeared. I did not know how it disappeared. It was just completely gone. So I just made one simple prayer. Lord, if it be your will to go and serve you in the Lord's ministry, let me work for three years. I asked for three years because my older brothers and sisters supported me through my university. And I have to work for a season of time and three years to help my younger brother, younger sister to finish their studies to fulfill my role as an older brother to my younger siblings. Just as my older siblings fulfilled their role to look after me when I studied in the U. What has happened? Something has happened inside. Not the outside, I still look the same. But something has happened inside whereby the thinking the motivation, the heart, the desire, all has been completely transformed. Once upon a time, you look at the church, no feeling, no attraction. You hear the name Jesus Christ, meaningless, cold and aloof to it. But now the sound of the name Jesus Christ, the hymns, the words of the hymns, they become so meaningful, something has happened. No more strangers, no more a foreigner to the things of God. God has quickened us. That is why it is called the household of God in the last part of verse 19. It has to be the work of God. God is the maker of this household. It is not man. That's why it cannot be a building. The building is made by man. You can go to the building control division in Singapore. You're going to find the blueprint of this building. You're going to find the names of the architect, the designer, the engineer. You're going to find the people who have chosen all these materials, the color scheme, everything. That's why it cannot be the building. It's the people. It's you, the believers. That's the building that will continue to grow larger and larger, bigger and bigger with every new believer who comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and as Saviour. That was how I came to know Christ. Heard the gospel, accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my Saviour. The only Son of God and the Son of Man who came down to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. And then rose again from the dead for my justification. And I accepted Him as my Lord, as my Saviour. And that Sunday morning after the service, a huge burden was lifted up from my shoulder. And then I looked at this world and I walked as if I was walking on air. I can't describe the feeling. I was so glad, so thankful. I look at the world, the world is still the same. But then how come I look at the world so differently with every passing week? It's still the same world. Something has changed. Long to go to church, happy to stay as long as possible in church, long and love to be with God's people, love to study His Word, to read His Word, to hear His Word. I would take bus and go anywhere in Singapore 
just to attend an evening service. Search high and low for evening services to attend. Finally, I thank God, I found Sunset Gospel Hour. And by the grace and mercies of God, God used the Sunset Gospel Hour to call me into full-time ministry three years later. No more strangers and foreigners to the things of God. And God says, what has happened? You are now fellow citizens with the saints. Now, with who are the saints? The saints that will have to include all the Old Testament saints. The saints will have to include all the saints that already were believers before you became a believer. So the moment you become a believer, you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, you will automatically become a fellow citizen with the saints. A fellow citizen simply means a native of the same town. In this case, a native of the same household of God. A household that is designed by God. And God has only one household because there is only one Christ. And God is the one who has chosen each and every one of us into this household that God has designed and it belongs to God. And that is the church. The church. You who is a believer makes up the church. All believers come together. We make up the church. And this is the church that the Bible speaks of, that this foundation has to be firm and strong to hold them. Now remember, this church was redeemed and purchased by God, not with gold, not with silver, with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, it is precious, it is very important to God because we are precious to God. If we are not precious to God, why would God send His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die a most horrendous and nightmarish death for us? To be crucified on the cross. And before His crucifixion, He was publicly humiliated and He has all the power of God at His disposal. And He allowed Himself to go through all these. And then to be crucified and then to die. Do you know that your sins and my sins put Him there? Your sins and my sins caused the crown of thorns to be sh pushed down his head and with the blood flowing down his face. It was your sins and my sins that caused him to receive all the whip that torn his back into shreds, exposing the bones because that's the kind of whip they use. They deliberately tie sharp pointed either thorns or bones. The design is to rip and tear the flesh of the victim. You call yourself a king, they put him on royal robe and they cover him and then they punch him and they mock him and they laugh at him. They humiliate him. You and I did that to him. And after we did all these things to him, God the Father says to us, you want to be saved, you want to be delivered from your sin, you want to get yourself out of your lust of the flesh and the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh and the trespasses that you have been committing all your life, you go back to him. The same person that you tortured, that you killed, that you crucified, you go to him and you ask him to be your Lord and your Savior. And that's why Jesus said to us, whomever my Father give to me, I will know why cast out. That's why Jesus says, I will receive you. I will forgive you. You know how hard it is for someone, if I have hurt you, I have betrayed you, I have caused you to lose your job, and then I kick you around and you're all face all blooded. And then now you're lying in the hospital. And then I get myself into very deep trouble and the only person who can help me is you. The same person that I've betrayed and I've kicked and I've hurt and now you are like a cripple in the bed and then you, the only one who can help me is you. And I have to go to you and ask you, please help me. And this is not even close to what we have done to Christ. He is the Son of God. This is how God built His building. This is how our building comes together. It is called the household of God, achieved and attained for us by God, by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. With a building that is so spectacular, so precious, you think the foundation will be weak? You and I know any building that we're going to decorate with precious material with the latest, the most beautiful marble, with the most expensive lighting, and you have all kinds of gold laid taps and everything that is made of metal will be stainless steel and platinum and gold with crusted diamonds and jewels. And then the foundation is made of rotten wood. Nobody in their right mind would ever do that. 
Like if God took the trouble through thousands of years to prepare Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you and for me, this is the household of God. You think the foundation will be weak? What do you think can be the best foundation that can support, that can hold up God's church, that God's church will continue to shine forth God's goodness, God's grace and God's mercy to a world that is steep in sin and transgression and wretchedness, wretchedness and in darkness? Verse 20. He described for us the foundation. And I build upon, right? So this household of God, there will be all of us redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and God did not save us and take us up to heaven. God says, I want you to remain on earth and I want to build you up so that you will be strong, so that you will be my godly shining light in a world that is in darkness. How to put you in a firm foundation that you will never, never tumble or fall no matter how the world may shake. Build upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What exactly is this foundation of the apostles and prophets? Please note foundation, one. Not many. But it's called the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. The apostles, there will be the New Testament. The teaching of the apostles. The New Testament and the prophets will be the entire Old Testament. There will be the Word of God, in other words. So the foundation in every church is not entertainment. When we were on the way here, my wife highlighted to me that there is a church that we just passed by. A movie star's name was there. Come and enjoy Easter with so-and-so. Is that how you want to build your church? Attract movie stars? And then movie stars will come and that's how a church will be firm and strong because it is filled with movie stars. And so a lot of people come, young people in particular, because they idolize these movie stars. You want your church to be built on this? What kind of church you want to build on movie stars? You and I know what kind of lifestyle many movie stars live by. They have a double standard. Movie stars, they have to tell themselves, deceive themselves. This is not reality. I'm pretending. You know, actors, you know, the, the, the Greek word for actors is called hypocrites. In English, we call them hypocrite. That's why when they go for the Academy Award, you know, you know how you should look at the Academy Award? You get all the hypocrites of the world <laughs> gathered there in their beautiful costume and now elect among all the hypocrites, the best hypocrite. <laughs> Seriously, isn't it? And so they award him. They call the Academy Award very gold and very nice. Huh? So he stands up there. Thank you, thank you for voting me the best male hypocrite. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, that, that's the word. Because it's true, isn't it? I mean, now they talk about this Abraham Lincoln. This guy is not Abraham Lincoln, but he pretends to be Abraham Lincoln. And then he pretends so well to, to, as uh, Abraham Lincoln. And so now we give you this award and call you the best hypocrite. Because you're not Abraham Lincoln, but you pretended the best. Out of all of us, you pretended the best of us, right? Isn't it true? That's actors, acting. Because they have two, two set of rules. Day to day life, one set. Acting, you're made to be a prostitute, you're made to be a harlot, you can't me to kill, you're made to do all these things. I will do because it's another set of rules. I'm just play acting. But the problem with these actors is that the play acting has become reality. That's why you look at their life, they have many husbands, many wives, they divorce and they. It's a wreck. You look at their life, it's a life of immorality. And it becomes so common that no one is ashamed of it anymore. Shameless. And you want to build your church on actors? Or what about entertainment? Get professional singers to come, get them to practice on Monday to Friday, pay them big bucks, and then have drums, have synthesizers, and then make it into no more a church, make it into like an entertainment center so they become very comfortable. Then we lure them in. You think God's church is going to be built on entertainers? The lives of entertainers keep on entertaining and you come to church to be entertained? That's what many churches are. That's what some BP churches have already gone in that direction. Do you realize that? You, all you need to do is just go onto the website of some of these BB churches and it's there. It's done. And we even have church gurus 
They will guarantee you, you pay them five-figure amount, they study your church upside down and they give you a set of guidelines and rules and they promise you within five to ten years, your numbers in your church will triple. And you know that when your numbers triple, your offering will also triple and then your salary will also triple. Why not? Because church means numbers. Is that what it's all about? Not from God's perspective. You are sinners. You were once strangers and foreigners to the things of God, to the household of God. And God saved you and me and make us part of this household by calling us fellow citizens of the household of God. How was it done? Through the blood of my only begotten son, God says. That's how you become part of my household. And you think that I'm going to put you on a foundation that is man-made? That is based upon entertainment? You think God cannot build his own foundation and God says the foundation is none other than the very perfect word of God. And of course, at this point in time, he's not referring to the King James Bible. King James Bible was not written until 1611, 17th century AD. The word of God already existed the moment God spoke. It was written from Moses' time onwards. Maybe earlier than Moses would be the book of Job. And it was written in Hebrew. And the New Testament written in Greek. And this is the perfect foundation, Hebrew and Greek. Why did God choose Hebrew? Why did God choose Greek? Why did God choose Korean or Mandarin? I don't know. I don't know why God did not choose Korean or Mandarin. If it is Mandarin, then up on Mount Sinai, God will speak to Moses. How to speak Mandarin? Huh? <laughs> I don't speak, that's the problem. I don't speak Mandarin. Commandment number one, T-E. Something like that. God did not say T-E, God said in Hebrew. Commandment number one, this is it. Command number two is in Hebrew. Now, even if you hold in your hands the perfect Hebrew, perfect Greek Bible, which we are using in our Bible college by the grace and mercies of God, the Trinitarian Bible Society, they printed it, and that's why we are using it to teach our students Hebrew and Greek. Now, even if you hold in your hands the two tablets of stones that God wrote using his finger in Hebrew, gave to Moses, and you hold them in your hands, but if you don't speak Hebrew, no use, isn't it? You probably look at these two stones and you probably worship the stone. Right? Wow, yeah. Finger of God, wow, this must be worshipped. So every day you come home, you look at this stone and you touch it, you worship it. God doesn't want us to do that. That's why we thank God for translations. We thank God for all those who have translated the Word of God into many, many languages. But translation will always be a translation. And the translation has to be based upon the perfect Hebrew and Greek Bible. And so we have to defend the perfect Bible. And the perfect Bible is in Hebrew and Greek. But the problem is sometimes people misunderstand us because we use English Bible to defend the Hebrew and Greek. And so sometimes people think that we are saying that the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God equivalent to Hebrew and Greek. And some people even say better than Hebrew and Greek. If that is the case, then we are all idiots. Because it is as good as saying that God spoke to Moses, you know, thou shalt not kill. Moses doesn't know King James English. He is not English. Right? He is not English. He is Moses, Hebrew. He speaks Hebrew. Alev, Bed, Gimel, Dalet, Hebrew. Not King James English. So that's why people misrepresent our perfect Bible position to caricature us and then with this caricature, they shoot us down. And so, Sadly, people believe this caricature. I know I'm not smart, but I don't think I'm that stupid, right? Moses spoke King James Bible, King James English. I mean, God spoke King James English to Moses. I mean, who in their right mind would even teach something so ridiculous and silly, right? Isn't it? And yet, people caricature our position and we defend the perfect Bible. And the scary thing is that people who believe this kind of caricature then you realize it is a spiritual warfare. It has nothing to do with the mind. If people can talk gibberish and call it a language, right? Gibberish comes out of their mouth. Thousands and thousands and millions of people all over the world, they call it tongue. And they talk rubbish and they think they've been told this is talking to God. You don't know what you're talking. How can God know what you're talking? 
And they say, oh, this is the language of angels. When did you become an angel? <laughs> right? And when angels spoke in the Bible, they all spoke proper English. No, no sorry. Proper Hebrew. Proper Greek. Right? They spoke proper Hebrew. When the angels, together with Christ, appeared to Abraham out in the wilderness in Genesis 18, they spoke Hebrew. When the angels went down to Lord to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, they spoke Hebrew. When the angel went to talk to Joseph and the Virgin Mary in the time of Christ, before Christ's birth, they spoke Greek. So they spoke proper languages. So you don't make angels look like fools. Angels don't talk. You don't know what you're talking. Angels know what they're talking, right? Now, if grown men, men with all kinds of degrees and they are responsible for multi-billion dollar organizations can do something like this. Actually, we should not be surprised, isn't it? When people caricature our position that the Bible is perfect and say that we are talking about the King James. We are not talking about the King James Bible. We are talking about the Hebrew and the Greek. If we are talking about the King James Bible, why are we teaching Hebrew and Greek in the Bible college in FEBC? Right? If it, King James is the perfect Bible, then the students should not be learning Hebrew and Greek and the students all will be very happy with you because now they are suffering. <laughs> you don't believe you ask the students who are studying Hebrew and Greek. I used to have a lot of hair, you know. <laughs> oh, it's a Hebrew. It's a Hebrew. You have to memorize hundreds of vocabulary and you cry, you know, because you haven't seen this Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dale. I mean, what kind of writing is this? So you've got to draw out. In the beginning, you've got to draw out. And you learn and you learn and you learn and your head drop and drop and drop. <laughs> your pastor used to be slim. Hebrew and Greek make him like that. <laughs> ah, you see, he have all kinds of impact. And very soon he'll be like that and also no hair. Ah, you see, it's going to come. Hebrew and Greek. Very, very wonderful to know, to know Hebrew and Greek because you'll open your eyes to the Word of God to a dimension that you have never and will never be able to grasp if you don't study it. But it's costly. <laughs> you pay a price. But the reward is worth it. I don't want to have a lot of hair and only know English. I'm happy to sacrifice. Just wear a hat now. Everything will be fine. <laughs> it's always the Greek and the Hebrew. The perfect word of God, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. You know something? The person I think on earth who understands the seriousness and the great importance of the foundation, which is the perfect Word of God, in holding the church up, holding you and me up in our life that we may shine brightly for Christ. You know who understands this the best? It's Satan. You know why I say Satan? Because he has never stopped attacking it. He attacked the Word of God in Genesis 3. He attacked the Word of God to deceive Eve, who in turn cause Adam to sin. He has never stopped attacking the Word of God. You study church history, he has never attacked, stopped attacking the Word of God. He attacked the inspiration of the Word of God in the early 1920s and 30s. And so the defenders of the Word of God came up with the statement, verbal plenary inspiration. Every word is inspired by God. And now in the 21st century, Cunningly, Satan now attacks the other end of the Word of God, and that is the preservation. And so we today borrow the same terminologies, verbal plenary inspiration in the 1920s and 30s. Now we borrow the same terms, verbal plenary preservation of the Word of God. Because if the foundation crumbles, if the foundation has mistaken, the foundation is weak, everything else will crumble and fall. You watch and you wait and see. Those churches who believe that the Bible has mistakes, you watch and you wait and see, they are going to crumble and they're going to fall. It's only a matter of time. It's when, it's not if. Do you know why? Because whenever you do a Bible study, if I am cheeky and naughty, I attend a Bible study, I ask the question, the moment you start reading the Bible, how do you know this verse has no mistakes? Truly, how do you know this verse has no mistakes? Oh, I just know. How do you know? Have you seen it before? No. Then how do you know it has no mistake? You don't believe God has preserved the word of God, right? Then how do you know this verse has no mistake? And I won't let them carry on until you assure me that this word is perfect. And they can't. So if I want to be cheeky, I attend a Bible study, they'll never start any Bible study because they're going to keep on finding, how, how do you, you're correct, how do you know? 
and you share the gospel, how do you know this gospel that you just share is no mistake? Now they say that, well, the mistakes are only in numbers and names and so on. It doesn't affect any doctrine. Who are you kidding? Numbers and names? How do you know the numbers and names are mistakes? If God cannot preserve something that you say is so insignificant, therefore how can God preserve something that is great? If something simple God cannot do, how can He do something that is great and preserve those so-called important verses? And then inspiration. Did God say, I only inspired important verses? Inspiration doesn't include names and numbers. Names and numbers are just as inspired. Every jot and every tittle is the very word of God. Don't you ever dare to have different degrees of inspiration, different degrees of perfection, different degrees of preservation. Every jot and tittle is the word of God, is the word of God. If names are not important, you sure it's not important? Then when God read out the book of life, Quack, are you here? <laughs> Sorry, not here. But it's me. No, what's your name? Caillou, you know. Is your Caillou? Not important, right? You said, right? Don't misspell your name and your name is not in the book of life. Not important, right? You end up in hell. Your name is not in the book of life. Not important. Name is not important. Don't be deceived. Satan will use every ways and means possible to crack the foundation. If you believe the Bible has mistakes, how are you going to build your life? How are you going to strengthen your faith? Every time you study, you have this doubt nagging at the back of your head. Is this correct? Is this verse, does it have mistakes? That's how deadly and subtle this latest attack is. Because it doesn't just attack one doctrine. In the past, in the 3rd and the 4th century, they attacked the humanity of Christ. That's one doctrine. They attacked the deity of Christ. That's one doctrine. But when they attack the whole Bible, do you know what it means? All doctrines are under attack. And when all doctrines are under attack, and they say it has mistakes, but I don't know where all the mistakes are. They won't tell you where all the mistakes are because the moment they tell you where all the mistakes are, correct them and you end up with the perfect Bible. That's why they say the mistakes somewhere out there, but... Don't know where all the mistakes are. You don't know where all the mistakes are, that means every doctrine is under attack. That is why it is so deadly, it is so subtle. It has the ring of truth. That is the problem. It has the sound of truth. Because it cannot be all wrong. Because if I say that this Bible, all of, everything has mistakes, everything is not the Word of God, surely you will not believe this doctrine. But if I say 99% is the Word of God, 1% is error, Sounds okay, isn't it? You still accept, isn't it? That's exactly what the problem is. That's exactly what has happened. Satan is smart. He has thousands of years to master the art of deception. Why do you think the Bible says he's the father of lies? You have a low view of God's word. You have a foundation that will crumble and fall. And your faith, your trust, your walk with the Lord will crumble with it. And your testimony will be gone. If you are truly born again, Truly, truly born again. You must never believe the Bible has mistakes. If you are truly, truly born again and out of ignorance, you will ever believe the Bible has mistakes, please understand your salvation will not be jeopardized. But you know what you will lose? You will lose your physical life, your testimony. And once your testimony is gone, it's gone forever. It's not going to come back. And then you'll become a pawn, a tool of Satan. And Satan will use you to be a stumbling block to the lives of many, many sinners in your world. Your loved ones. They are going to be stumbled by your life, by your way of teaching, by your way of living. And don't think that, well, as long as I'm going to heaven, it does not matter. It matters. If as long as you go to heaven, it does not matter how you live this life, then God would have just taken us home and put us in heaven. You think he could not do that? He could. But he says, I want you to remain on earth and be my witnesses. And you know how great an honor and privilege it is to have this life that once upon a time was what? Controlled by the lust of our flesh. And now these hands have been washed by the blood of Christ, no more stained by sin. The same hands that used to be slaves to sin. God says, I want you to use these hands to serve me. And I, God says, you can use it now to do good works for my glory. Won't you? This... Tongue, this mouth of yours, used to curse, used to tell lies, used to deceive. 
sanctified by the blood of Christ, now use it to tell the world about me. Don't you dare say and think that your life on this earth as a testimony for Christ is not important. It is very important to God. And that's why the foundation has to be the perfect word of God as God himself has said. The prophets and the apostles, the very word of God itself, that is how God has built us and placed us on this foundation. Now please don't be so naive. We live in the 21st century. There are many churches that will use the Bible. There are many churches that will say, you see, I also use the Bible, so it must be an okay church. Every church has a Bible, but not every church has Christ. And that's why the second half of verse 20 is so crucial. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Do you know what is the chief cornerstone? You see, in every building, there are many corners. I mean, this building is not a normal rectangular building. Let's say you have a rectangular building. Let's say four sides, all right? And then on top of it, you will have another four more sides, so you have a total of eight sides. And then if you put a wall and divide this rectangular house of yours into many rooms, so you have many more corners. But the first corner that you put is called the chief cornerstone because that first corner is the corner where every other corner will take its reference point. That's how they build buildings. So if I want to build a rectangular building and make sure that the walls are right angle and make sure that the size is according to what I desire and what I own, the piece of property, the chief corner is where I take all my reference points. I do not, let's say, measure from here to here and then the next corner, I don't measure from this corner because if I make a slight error in this corner, and the error will compound itself. Then from this corner, I don't measure from this second corner, I measure from the first corner. And then when I want to have this corner, also measure from here. Then the next corner, all measure from here. Every corner of the building will take its reference point from this chief corner. So that the building will be accurate, the building will be built precisely according to the heart's desire of the builder. That's why it's called the chief corner. And Jesus Christ is the chief corner. It is not just the mentioning of the name Jesus Christ. You cannot be this naive, right? Satan is not so foolish. Satan is not going to say, well, those who are my followers, go there and infiltrate into churches and tell them that you are a worshipper of Satan. I mean, Satan is not an idiot, right? If you want to send in a spy, your spy has to look like the people that is in your congregation. So let's say Satan wants to send a spy to get that many. Now, how does the Gethsemane people dress? Right? They all dress like that. Nice short hair and then all, all dress properly. Right? So if I want to send a spy to infiltrate into Gethsemane, I won't look, going to send some clown who's going to have rainbow color hair. Right? The moment you, Reverend Dad sees him, I, how, this, you want to be a member, please cut your hair, fix it, change it to black color. Right? See, he'll teach you how to be a proper spy. Right? He's, teaching, he's teaching you now. Right, you gundu, how can you be have a, how can you be a, how can you become part of this group and your hair is like that? And then they carry a proper Bible. You probably carry a Bible, you don't carry a newspaper. You carry a Bible. You see, they all carry a Bible, not newspaper. So you must know how to carry, you must know how to like, you see? So Satan will do the same, right? I mean you and I know to how to do that. You want to be a spy, you must look like the people so that you can mix in, blend in, and not be noticed. So it's not just Jesus Christ. It must be Jesus of the Bible. It has to be the Jesus that is according to Holy Scriptures. Not just somebody say Jesus Christ. The Roman Catholic also used Jesus Christ. The Charismatic used Jesus Christ. The Mormons used Jesus Christ. So many other cults also used Jesus Christ. As early as the days of the writing of the Apostle John, test every spirit. Because Gnosticism also used Jesus Christ, but the Gnostics believed that the flesh is inherently evil. They say that we believe in Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ cannot come in the flesh because flesh is evil. But we believe in Jesus Christ. That's why John taught the Christians in those days. Test them. Find out what is their Achilles heel. What doctrine do they hang on to that contradicts the Bible? Find out. Ask them the question. Did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? They can't accept that. So their Jesus that they say they believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible because Jesus must come in the flesh. So you have to be wise. This foundation that built us up simply means you have to study it, you have to know it, you have to imbibe it, you have to meditate upon it. That's how this foundation will build you up. It's not taking the Bible, put it under my pillow and sleep on it. That's not how you build the foundation. It means you teach it. 
Your church must have good, solid preaching, teaching, many Bible studies. And the pastor must not be involved in anything else as what our founding principle has taught us. Focus 24-7 and be a good teacher and preacher of God's Word. Don't hold any other job. Don't buy stocks and shares. Just study God's Word. That's what you must do because what the congregation needs is the Word of God and you have to defend the Word of God, have the highest honour, regard for the Word of God. And then they will know the Jesus of the Bible. So that when they go out into the world, they are going to have friends, they're going to have colleagues, they're going to have acquaintances that will sound like Christian, talk like Christian, behave like Christian, but they are not Christians. So you cannot be naive. Jesus Christ must be the chief cornerstone. Everything that you believe in must be Jesus Christ as the reference. Not the Bible Presbyterianism. Don't use BP. Well, they are not like me. But you are BP. It's not BP. It is Jesus Christ. That is the chief cornerstone, not your church. It has to be the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible. He must be the chief cornerstone. That is why it is so important that Jesus Christ of the Scripture, you must know Him well. Otherwise, when people say, oh, I also believe in Jesus, and you do not know what to do. Is He also a child of God? Is He God-honouring? Is He part of the household of God, just like I am? And then when you talk to Him more, you realise that He is not. His Jesus speaks gibberish. Tongues. His Jesus understands tongues. Your Jesus doesn't understand tongues, doesn't talk in tongues. His does. How, how can you have prayer meeting together? It's not the same Jesus. His Jesus, though, they have entertainment. His Jesus is an entertainer. You look at their worship. Your Jesus is not an entertainer. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is awesome. You come to their church, you go to their church, it is frivolous. God is like a Santa Claus. God is one who will give me all the material things that I want. Jesus did not die on the cross to fatten your wallet. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. And therefore it fills our hearts with humility and gratitude and thanksgiving where we want only to promote and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And He must increase and we decrease. We don't want to be known. We only want people to know Christ and the Christ of the Bible. The Word of God is the living Word. Christ is the, the Word of God is the written Word. Christ is the living Word. Know the Bible is to know Christ. And that's how Christ can be your chief cornerstone. If you don't know the Word of God, you do not know Christ. So the focus on the foundation is Jesus Christ. You study the Bible, you must promote Christ. You know the Bible, you must promote Christ. Christ must always be the focus in the Bible. That's why theologian says, if you want to summarize the whole Bible, it's two words, Jesus Christ. All 66 books of the Bible, you can summarize it in two words, Jesus Christ. Truly, right from the very beginning, we were introduced to Christ. The seed of a woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Jesus Christ. The last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ will ride on a white horse and this time when He appears, He's not going to come as a Saviour, He's going to come as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and all sinners, when they see Him coming down onto earth on the white horse, don't you dare cry, save me, save me. He's not coming to save you. Jesus says, I'm coming to judge you. Because the Bible says when Jesus comes on the white horse, again, every human being your state and your condition at that point in time will be sealed forever. The righteous will be righteous forever. That means if you're going to be a Christian at that point in time, you're going to be a Christian forever. But if you are wicked and evil, you're going to be wicked and evil forever. The message is clear, isn't it? The first coming of Christ, I come as a saviour. The second coming of Christ, for the first time the world will see the resurrected Christ. The same Christ that they crucified. Now I'm going to come as a judge. That's why he will always be the chief cornerstone. Whether you like it or not, he will be the chief cornerstone. If you don't make him the chief cornerstone, he will still be the chief cornerstone. He's going to be the one that God is going to measure everyone. Whether you truly belong to the household of God. God is the one who originated this house through the blood of Christ. God is the one who owns this house and he will always own this house. And he says the foundation is God's word. 
and the chief cornerstone of this foundation where every doctrine, everything must take its reference point, Jesus Christ. Defend God's word. Love God's word. That's all that we need and that's all that we have that will build us up, strengthen us and keep all of us firm and true to our Saviour until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Let us pray.